All right. Hey, hey, Kate, thank you so much for coming on today. How you doing? I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be here. I love, love, love these sketching videos that you put up, uh, and I'm a big fan of drawing and sketching to break through, uh, to come up with breakthrough ideas and to think about this molasses that's going in on our head and put it down on paper because it gives you new ideas and new things that you are kind of you know, feeling, but you had a hard time explaining. Can you go into a little bit about the sketching as a tool for thinking? Sure. So one of the things that I'm, I've been an entrepreneur for uh, officially kind of the last three years before that, very entrepreneurial in different other contexts, but one area that from the very early parts of my career that has always been brought along is the power of making something kind of gettable, or as I call it, like visual and sketched out. And we have a lot more visual methods in our businesses now. We use PowerPoint or we have explainer videos. But there's something about thinking through an idea with your hands and actually physically sketching it out that forces the kind of thoughtfulness that you don't get when you write or when you talk. And it's kind of this in-between that's really... What is, what is that? Because I, that, that, that's exactly it. There's something about with your hand on the paper and drawing out. What, what is that? Is there some part of the brain that gets engaged that's different? Than when we're there typing is, things there is, there is. Like the oldest part of our brain is optimized for pattern recognition in the environment in a spatial way where our bodies are doing a lot of the thinking for us, whether it's kinesthetic thinking or kind of action thinking as they're calling it. Um, okay. But it's really deep-seated evolutionally that we understand through pictures and a visual spatial understanding. And you know, language, frankly, is a pretty recent brain development. It's a great innovation, made all kinds of things awesome, um, but language and writing are pretty light followers to this intrinsic spatial understanding. And wow. when you draw, you reactivate that, not only for yourself as a thinking tool, but for other people who can see what you're, what you're actually thinking and being able to draft off of it or understand it or extend it. And it just centers the conversation in a really fundamentally interesting and important way. Well, uh, I'm myself included, I know plenty of others feel horrible when they're drawing their stick figures and they, they, they have a hard time doing it themselves, let alone sharing it with other people to get their message across. How do you overcome the sort of internal, you know, phobia of like literally drawing? Sure. I think the biggest thing is you have to let go of an understanding of what a good drawing is. You just have to recognize this is not art, right? I mean, some of the most profoundly transformative sketches I've seen ended up looking like squiggles on a paper because they were accompanied by a talking through of a process. And that kind of uh, letting go of what it should look like and that it doesn't look right and accurate and really understanding the symbolic meaning of it um, is, is just that smooths the deck a lot. The second thing is just start. Right, just grab my favorite's the Sharpie because when you use a Sharpie, you can't, it's unforgiving and that forces you just to keep going. You can scribble out, it's a strong, effective line, and just start. Um, okay. You'll find that as you start sketching and thinking at the same time, it just becomes much more natural incredibly quickly. It's, it's super surprising. Really? Okay, so can you give us some examples where. Um, where sketching an idea or sketching out a problem uh, really comes, you know, it really helps to actually sketch it out versus writing it out or journaling or whatever, another method? Yeah, one of the uh, tactics we use at Luxor, which is a company I was a fa I'm a founder of, uh, is to try and understand what is the human experience your product is intended to deliver. And if you're thinking about human experiences, showing a human being having an experience, so mm. in a context, in a scenario, Right. Having some emotion, those are the three elements that is really important to be able to communicate that experience. Uh, right. You can't do it with an interface. An interface is the thing they're looking at or using. Right, right. And you can't do it with words because, you know, it's just not expressive enough. It takes a long time to describe, for example, a tree or a wheel in just words or, right. God forbid, write it out. You can draw it and people get it. Gotcha. So having some super simple tools, and we use a technique called Clothespin Man because he kind of looks like an, an old-fashioned clothespin, and I, just having a basic understanding, like just a couple simple tools right. can help you get the meaning across. It's not about how good it looks. It's about getting that meaning across. I, I love the fact that you brought up the look, the Clothespin Man. I watched several of those videos, the, the two or three videos you have up on uh, your site, and I, you know, it just brought me back to the book that I read, the sketching behind the napkin, and I just like, oh man, this is like, 
you know, I have my own internal phobias, the perfectionism, and just like it's okay if it's not if it's messy and it's not perfect. But uh, seeing that and just seeing you do it with the snappy music in the background, I almost felt like busting out my iPad and starting to do it myself right then and there. You know, it was really uh, quite motivating. Do uh, it, do it, just get yeah, started. It was really motivating, um, and I honestly believe um, I'm really comfortable in Photoshop and and kind of Illustrator and using computer tools. But for some weird reason, sketching is still a little bit hard for me. Um, but yeah, can you can you share some some? I know you had some um, you know posters and some pages back there, uh, some stuff that you've done, and kind of walk us through some of that. Sure. So it's interesting that you talk about the the sketching and and it does feel different from digital tools. And in fact, I I happen to have that handy book right here. Dan there Rose, is. A thinker. He started out as a UX designer and strategist. Um, and he talked about this back of the napkin idea as a way of visual problem solving. But one of the quotes that I love that he says is he says, the more human the picture, the more human the response. Mm. So it turns out that when you show something that looks handmade or rough, it invites participation and it helps people understand it. If it looks too polished, too fine, it's right. unaccessible for people. Wow. So as entrepreneurs, when we're early in our businesses, we want those human pictures. We want right. them to be inviting participation, not you know right. showing off our, our pretty, pretty skills. And, and, and let's be clear. Uh, when you say human pictures, you mean a human actually interacting with, let's say, some technology or within the context of how the technology impacts that human. Is that right? That can be one. The way Dan meant it is it looks like a human being made it. Mm. Oh, it looks like so. It actually yeah. doesn't look like it was machine refined. So right. even if you're super fast sketching an illustrator, and I know many professionals who are, right. um, the fact that that looks like a precision, high fidelity finished product. Right, right. You know, the kind of feedback you get for that is, oh well, I don't. You know, that person is standing in the wrong place, or that person there's a typo in that description. Right. It's not going to get that broad, rough feedback that you really want when you're forming an idea. Right, right. I completely agree. So yeah, let, let's let's step through some examples to give people an idea of what we're talking about. Sweet. So this is a quick and dirty sketch I did about two minutes before we started. It's a known yeah. model that we've used at Luxor for a long time, and it's okay. what we think of as a simplified way of talking about the user experience stack. Okay. So I don't know any entrepreneurs that aren't trying to get awesome user experiences out in the world. I love and this so idea. Before you go on, user experience perfect. stack. I love that. You know, there's the developer stack, the marketing stack, the UX stack. This is the first time I've heard that. Yeah, it, and it, it actually does work as a continuum, but what I love about it is it doesn't have to all work linearly because we know the real world doesn't work that way. Right. But the general idea is that you start out, there's users, human beings in the world, right. and people have needs and goals and motivations, things they're trying to accomplish. Right. And you can translate, as an entrepreneur, our role is to translate those, to understand those needs and goals and to translate them into what I think of as uses or scenarios um, and these aren't use cases, these are broader, okay. but it's what product, what role does that product have in your user's life that gives them intrinsic and fundamental value? Like what can they do with your product that they can't do right now without it? Okay, okay, so hold on, hold on right there, hold on. So what sure. can they do with, with your product that they can't do with any other product? Yep. That is considered a use? Yes. Okay, gotcha. So, and, you know, it might be taking pictures and sharing them online. It might have, you know, Instagram was not the first digital photo sharing application out there, but it had right. something intrinsically interesting and easy and viral and fun functionally different that right. was unique, and it gotcha. got that adoption. Gotcha. So from those uses, of which you might have a handful of, from right. those you distill out the features. Okay. And I don't know about you, but many developers and designers, when we have an idea in the world, we start right. with the features like, oh, we could build this and this. Absolutely. And you know, that's yeah. fine, but right. don't build that stuff. Don't right. build it until you've walked those features back up to figure out what human beings they serve and what needs they fulfill. Right. right. And then from those features, and you have a collection of those, you right. have a responsibility to put them together in a holistic, kind of brand-driven, understandable, usable way. Okay. And that's all down here. I love this. So, uh, let, can we step through this a little bit more? So, sure. let's say you know I I want to develop an app for dog walkers. I'm just gonna randomly pick them. You know, my first thought as a designer is I'm gonna start mocking up the iPhone interface. I'm gonna start coming up with ways that maybe we can attach some a device to the dog, and maybe the dog sends images. And I'm thinking of technology, and I'm thinking of what we can do with the technology. And I'm jumping right into the feature set. 
a mock-up of a dog, you know, a visual user interface for how the dog sees the world, maybe how the dog walker sees the world, and how that mock-up would look like. And and before I'm doing that, I'm not really thinking about what their problems are and what their needs are. I'm just thinking like, oh, let me just think of what the cool user interface will be. And I kind mm -hmm. of imagine what their problems are, but I don't really know. And this is a common problem for a lot of designers and entrepreneurs. How do we get, how do we get past that? Sure, it's, and it's actually one of the reasons that the most fundamental reason that startups fail, right, is they're not solving a problem that's actually important to anybody. Yeah. So we build a bunch of stuff, we put it out in the world, and instead of, you know, uh, understanding and learning, we tend to launch and burn. So that's, that's scary. So how we do that, and I love that you say that you've jumped right into envisioning, you know, the smart collar or the iPhone app or the right. slider that's going to make it all sexy, yeah. uh, and that's all down here. Yeah. And you know, people enter ideas in different places, and there's three different trends I've seen. So you talk about entering it down here. You envision these with this world of features. Right. Other entrepreneurs I know envision the people. I want to make something that serves dog walkers. I love people with dogs. I want to serve them. So they enter kind of around the human beings. Okay. And others enter around a problem that needs to be solved. Right. So oh. I envision. I I think that dog walkers spend too much time picking up after their dog, and I want to solve that problem. Right. Right? And that's really around this needs and goals. Mm. So you can enter the problem anywhere you want. But as an entrepreneur and as a service to our customers, we have a responsibility to move up and down this as we see fit. I love this. I love the fact that you bring the multiple perspectives on how they enter in this whole stack because you're absolutely right. As a designer, as a UX or a you know, web user interface person, I love just mocking up interfaces. <laughs> and I haven't really thought about what the problems are. And I've talked to many lean startup folks, and uh, you know, the real problem is is going out and really talking with the people that are having the problem, and reaching out to them, and doing the cold calling, and doing the cold emailing, and getting on Twitter and finding them, or going on LinkedIn and reaching out to these people because it's like not as much fun as like sitting in Photoshop and mocking stuff up. Right. And, uh, yeah, any suggestions on how we can fix that problem? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm like you. I come into that feature set, and I'm like, oh, features, woo, and I start sketching or mocking things up, or I'll make a tutorial video, whatever that is. I give myself an hour. I actually time box it with a timer and say, okay, Kate, you can have an hour to luxuriate in the best awesome features <laughs> and how you're, you know, winning a Webby Award or how your team has grown multinational, whatever that right. is. Like, envision, yeah. but do it for an hour. Okay. And then set all that stuff aside yeah. and then start walking back up that chain. So why does that matter? Two techniques that I think are super helpful to get yourself up and down this chain is okay. when you start with the features, you have to ask why. And mm -hmm. why would that matter? What is that feature doing for someone? And you'll start edging into these scenarios and uses, and then you can ask why. Why does that matter? That'll push you up into the needs and goals, and then for whom? Like, why Why do people have this need in the world? That can help you circle around some of the customer pieces. I love it. I love this. I, I watched another one of your videos, the, the whys, the five ways, or five whys. <laughs> I loved it. So this is almost like, you know, why does this feature matter and for whom? So those are a couple yeah. of questions you can get deeper into the root of maybe the use or problem that you're solving. So I yeah. love this. I love all this. So can you give us some examples in your past that you actually reached out to a specific segment that you thought were having a problem and what you learned and how that sure. informed your decision maker or the sketching that you had to do to get it, get to it? Or Yeah, so at, at Luxor, uh, our role is to help entrepreneurs succeed by providing a, a series of activities and tools that help people kind of move through this stack. So that's our, that's our bread and butter. We have a okay. digital product that does that. Um, when we started out, it was a in-person design studio time for early stage teams, and it was very face-to-face, -face, very hands-on, but we knew that that couldn't scale appropriately. So when I joined as a co-founder, part of the challenge was to pivot into a productized offering that could awesome. go worldwide and globally. So Love that's it. a little bit of the background. Okay. And the very first prototype that we put together, we spent half a day envisioning like who are we? What problems have we seen? What problems do we suspect or have a hunch that entrepreneurs have right. around articulating, you know, good experiences or getting out and talking to customers? Right. And so we spent half a day, the three of us founders, sketching out stories and intentionally walking up and down this stack, recognizing that all of this was hypothesis, which right. means that all could kind of be bunk, right. yeah, <laughs> and we yeah. had to go out and validate it. 
Right. Um, I don't have those sketches at hand, but I'm happy to share them afterwards with some okay. of the visioning that we did. And there's, again, super simple sketches and scenarios of use. Okay. The next piece was we, we put our mind around, what is the smallest, simplest thing we could build to put in front of people and validate if they're having the behaviors and talking about their problems in the way that we predict? Okay. And to do that, we had a hard timeline. Um, we were going to go speak at a conference in Japan. We didn't want to do the user testing in Silicon Valley because it's such a rich, kind of knowledgeable right. um, group out here that we wanted to really get away from that okay. and be working in more of an emerging ecosystem. Okay. So we built this prototype of the first activity, which, interestingly enough, is making a persona for your, the people you suspect will use your product. So I oh, love it. So that's, that's the idea of this product you guys are making. Okay. Yep. So it was a persona in a box, okay. and it was a physical kit of materials going to the Sharpie and the paper oh, type of really? sketching. Okay. Wow. All and right. Just not digital at all at that time, although it had a, so, a walk-through so video. So a shippable product is what you're saying. Shippable product, And yes. that theoretically could scale. You could send out several hundred of these a month or whatever. Exactly. Turns out it doesn't scale as well as purely digital, but <laughs> right. the hands-on was fundamentally important, and we felt that that was a differentiator that we wanted and to And did you feel like your initial market where all these incubators are popping up all over the place? Is that... Or we really we anybody? wondered about that. We ended up... Um, the, the end goal has always been the individual entrepreneurial team. Okay. Um, but incubators are such a much more effective way of kind of sharing that out in a bulk way. It helped us validate right. faster. Right. And we learned a lot from on, from the incubator organizers about what they felt success was for entrepreneurs, and that was an important input to how we shaped the product. Wow, okay. Yeah, tell me more about this. This sounds like a cool product. So two things happen. So I make this, so we make a prototype, and you know that's when I got to go into Photoshop and make a bunch of stuff, and that was exciting. Right. Um, yeah. Spent way too long there. I'll never do that again. I could have just handwritten it, <laughs> sketched it out. Like right. anyway, yeah. um, and the very first thing, talk about fear of people. Uh, you know, I talk to customers a lot. I'm pretty pretty good at it from my deeper user experience roots. And uh, we had a, an entrepreneur come in, and Janice, the co-founder and founder of, of Luxor, was there. And I had this brand new like box, like everything I bought, like at the art supply store. This was so not manufacturable, right? It was okay. this prototype. Right. And Jenna says, hey, let's do a quick and, and dirty usability test. Right. And I literally would not let go of the box. Like I'm clinging to it because it's not ready, it's not done. Right. And that was before I learned the principle that you have to be embarrassed by the time you show something. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. Me. Quick and dirty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so Janice literally kind of tears this out, out of my uh, yeah, Let go, let go. Painful. Right. And she sits down, and the first thing the entrepreneur does, she opens it up, and she's unfurling this, in hindsight, overly complicated thing. And and she's doing, she's like interested, and she's like, oh, I have this need. I don't know how to talk to customers. I haven't been able to put the right thinking around a persona. This makes sense to me. Okay. And she comes to the point where she needs to go online for the video walkthrough of the tutorial and there's no way for her to get online, right? There's no call to action, there's no link, there's no nothing. Right. And I'm like, oh my god, so I write a sticky note, I'm like, and then you go online, right? I, I was there right there with an interception. But talk about like a most boneheaded move, like it's so obvious, but until I had sketched out what we wanted, Put it in, made some approximation, and put it in front of someone. You don't see the big gap. Yeah, you don't know where the issues are going to come up. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen. Yeah, you're not alone with all these sort of like I want to make it really lovely and want to make it nice and perfect or whatever, and it's not good enough. Yeah. These all these internal things trip us up. Uh, can you share any other uh, examples you've had in the past where sketching it out would have helped, or you know? Yeah. So one of the um, techniques that this is. Gonna, I'll come back to how that is the point for entrepreneurs, but one of the techniques and the real upwellings around visual methods now is this concept called sketch noting. Okay. Not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's it's hit the design field pretty well, and a lot of developers are also adopting it. It's a way of taking verbally do delivered information, often through interviews like this or TED talks or conference talks, right. and doing and capturing them visually. Um, with a lot of words, but also some visual annotations that help you remember and stabilize that information more effectively. Gotcha. Can you show us a couple examples, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I'll show you just a little bit about... Um, from. So Mike Rohde is the one who wrote the book, and he's he's kind of the the person who coined that phrase, and, and his sketch notes are pretty awesome, but I think when you think about it, they tend to look a little bit like this, okay. which is... You know, a lot of words, but right. some um, visual texture. And then hang on one second, let me grab another one. Sure. Mm. 
So depending on the, um, on the nature of the content, uh, they can get more or less pictorial. I've actually been working on a series of these, which is oh, for wow. an online program, which is essentially walking through, you know, <clears throat> this Roger Martin, who's a well-known strategist, okay. and capturing some of the ideas. And, and the things that make it helpful is he's got this little model here. You okay. know, again, super simple, but it's the kind of thing that having learned that verbally and through, you know, listening and capturing it with my own hands, I'm much more likely to take that to the team and say, here's a model we can use, and draw it on a whiteboard, draw it on a, on a napkin or a sticky note. And okay. I think when we capture information visually, okay. we're more likely and more adept at understanding it and being able to remember it so that we can bring those offerings of novel thinking to our teams. It, it, I've noticed that this is almost like a large pictorial. kind of reminds me a little bit of a mind map. It's like putting all the stuff all up in one frame and one page and kind of encapsulating it. Is it... Is it a is it one of the big features? Is this sort of ho big whole you know the whole picture point of view? Is that like a bird's eye view? Is that like a big deal? Is that it is a big, big deal? Okay. You have to simplify to get that. I love the the reference to mind maps. Mind maps is one of the very first entries to visual note taking that I ever had years ago. Right. Yep. Um, and the the radiant thinking actually prompts new thinking and related yep. thinking, which we yep. know is part of how innovation and interesting things happen. Right. Um, and it's also because it's spatial and it's laid out, you can grok a much a very detailed picture of the world in a very fast review. Right, so. right, got you. I have to say, some of those sketch notes look really lovely and pretty, and I think to myself, like, I don't know if I can make it look that, that lovely. So I think maybe a combination of that and then with your little pin, you know, man thing, I think could be a, could work for me, personally. And yeah, for a lot of people, so I, I have, would imagine. I have, I have two phrases. One is ubu, um, useful but ugly. Okay, useful but ugly. <laughs> and wow, that is so great. Useful, useful but ugly. Does anybody own that domain? Somebody should get that. <laughs> useful but ugly. That is great. And then the other is like P PBP, which is pretty but pointless. Pretty but pointless. <laughs> 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 wow, that is hilarious. You don't understand. These are like, you could create a whole book on both of those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's a trap that, frankly, we don't ever know what's, I mean, I can pointless. give a hunch of what's ugly, but I don't know if it's useful or useless until I talk to someone about it. God, that is so crazy. I, I really get caught up in this whole pretty but pointless sometimes. I really do. You get enamored by beautiful things. You're like, oh, look how pretty those colors are. I yeah, know. and then you just sometimes lose the forest from the trees and all that kind of thing, so. I know. I think one of the changes I'd really like to see in big organizations and in the venture-driven part of, of startups mm -hmm. is a real understanding for rough and effective and rough and beautiful. I think the lean startup has done a lot um, to introduce those ideas, but it's very difficult to show something that, frankly, looks like crap but has great thinking behind it to right. someone who's used to seeing a higher fidelity, more polished result. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that. Uh, looks like crap, but has a great amount of thinking in there. High quality thinking. I love that. That's so great. How, can you think of any examples in your past where that was the case? Yeah, there was um, there was a model that I made of, this is bizarre, this way back machine in my, in Startup 1.0. Okay. Um, I was, uh, I had the longest title in the world. I was the senior director of online business management and operations or some god-awful okay. thing. It was, it was terrible. Right. Right. Anyway, we had a, a pretty complicated product, but we were looking at seeing how it would work in organizations. And I was playing pool. This is kind of foosball pool. It was that type of startup. We were in growth stage, so we had cool. some good funding. Yeah, yeah. So it was like 11 p.m., and I'm playing pool before going back and doing a little bit of JSP, ASP stuff at the time. And okay. I had this idea, and I, I sketched it out actually on my hand because I didn't have a piece of paper, but I always carry a pen. Mm -hmm. So I sketched it out on my hand about the way that this, this product could be released to multiple different or, um, communities within a company and actually get more viral. We didn't yeah. have that phrase then, but get more viral. Okay. And it was right. a really interesting model, and it kind of had some of the behaviors that would need to happen to do that. And it was small and messy because it was on my hand. On your hand, right. And I didn't want to, you know, keep it on my hand forever, so I went over to the right. photocopier and I photocopied my hand and right. then the next day I showed it to um, to the director of the area that I was at and right. even though it was this like photocopy of a hand, he saw the promise in it 
and I ended up presenting that at a strategy meeting a couple weeks later, all PowerPointed up and much much more effective. Wow. But in between then, that hand sketch took the form of some other um, paper-based sketches right. because the thinking was, was really solid. And it was basically a way to say, if we have a footprint in one organization, how can we get everybody in all of the adjacent departments using this thing as well? which wow. because we were a server-based model would have really dramatically expanded our sales. Right. So it was again that they could see the promise of the thinking even though it was a horribly right. ugly right. Um, original thing. And this is all uh, started with a drawing on your hand. Wow, imagine yep. that. Well, Southwest you know, Airlines started with a drawing on a napkin. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. That's the triangle. Wow. Okay. So, um, are there uh, any resources beyond a couple of the books that you mentioned that if people, uh, developers, speci specifically developers, because they're they're notorious about like not wanting to visualize stuff, they'd rather just go right into the code, you know, and start coding. What well, what are some good easy resources that people can possibly look at to get into this? Yeah. You know, one of my favorites is by Dan Rome. It's the Napkin Academy. And Napkin it, Academy. It's very, okay. The Napkin Academy. It's his online presence for uh, for helping people learn to to do these tools. It tends yeah. to skew a little bit more maybe business managery, um, but he's there's it's an incredibly easy learning curve. A lot of material, totally worth the price of subscription. Um, I think that is one of my favorites, especially for people who are acclimated to digital learning and don't want to go out and buy a book or read a book. Right. Right. The second book that is that I have is I think it's. You know, I actually have it. I'm going to be right back. Hang on. No problem. This book cracks me up because it, this comes under the category of just start. Just uh, start and do something. Right. It doesn't even have an author because it's so basic. It is called 642 six things, to things which hopefully developers will get and love the 42 reference. <laughs> and frankly, like seriously, this is a bunch of blank pages with a prompt to draw something. <laughs> so, That's awesome. And I keep a blank copy and then I have a copy I work with. But you'd be surprised at what weird little things you you have kind of an internal picture of that you can't draw externally. Right. And just the novelty of trying to make things like that does two things. A, it helps with your just hand-eye coordination. And the beauty of it, anything you make is going to be precious to you. Right. Even if it's ugly, it's going to be like, I made yeah. that. Yeah, you awesome. made that. Right, right, right. No, I yeah. completely agree. Uh, can you share with us some tips on how to work with others and, and how to share these drawings and how to get people to kind of get involved, even if they're kind of scared a little bit? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> great. There's two. There's a good tip on this, which is, before I'm going to back up just a little bit, there's drawing to think something through, and then there's drawing to communicate it out. Okay. And they can both be pretty rough. Uh, but when you're trying to think something through, it's a higher likelihood that it's going to be even messier, that you're going to do multiple iterations, like draw it once and then draw it again and then draw it again, as you're actually putting the, the thought and design of what you're trying to communicate. So there's drawing to think and there's drawing to communicate. Uh, and because of that, when you're, ta when you're working with a team, if you already have an idea that you have thought through, practice sketching it out. And then when you draw them with, when you draw it in front of them and use drawing as or sketching as an illustration as you're tracing the thinking behind it, okay. is uh, incredibly engaging. If you've seen the uh, RSA videos, which oh, are right. videos, yeah. that, right? Yeah, like they're visually, yeah. they're not yeah. a visual crack. You just right. can't look away. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, do, that. do it on a whiteboard. Do it on a piece of paper. Okay, so let's say for a moment, uh, I'm a big fan of virtual teams. In fact, I work with several people remotely, and as we're doing this, we're doing this remotely. Um, how would I be able? Let's say I have a Google Hangout, and I've got my me and my developer buddy on, and we're trying to think through like uh, how we can possibly get more conversions on our site or whatever it is. And I'm sort of writing out, drawing out ideas. Do I? Do I kind of just draw it out and show it to my webcam and then he does it? or uh, how, how does that work? There's a bunch of different techniques that are emerging because, that, frankly, that is an unsolved problem. It's super hard. Okay. Uh, there's good tools. If you have any kind of sketching tool uh, that you can share using Google Hangouts, which is great because it allows for collaborative um, kind of writing or drawing, those are great because you can actually draw. It's hard to draw with a mouse. So I think iPad apps are getting a lot better. There's Paper. There's Vittle. There's a few of those that are starting to really mature. Okay. Um, and then the lastly, but honestly, I've been incredibly successful, like holding something up, pointing yeah. to it, 
Yeah. And then often taking a picture of it and texting it so that oh, they have a reference there. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I do, the problem is, is that when you draw it on paper, theoretically, if you took a photo of it and you sent it to him and then let's say it's Jeff and Jeff prints it out and, and then he starts drawing on top of that and then I still have my original drawing and he shows me his tweak and then I go like, oh, that's interesting and then he takes a photo of that. So there is a lot of that back and forth but I guess theoretically that would be one way of doing it. But mm -hmm. I, think, I think an ideal mechanism would be an iPad app that is almost like live. Like we're drawing on the iPad or a Wacom tablet or a, you know, something like that, yeah, yeah. Have you seen anything like that, an iPad app that, that's live like that? Not live like that that hooks into the, uh, that hooks into the kind of the ecosystem of having a, a laptop or there's better functionality for, yeah. for um, remote like, stuff like this. Yeah, it sounds like a great things. product. Yeah, sounds like it might There's be also product. the iPivo, which is a little camera. It was designed for teachers, and it's awesome, and it hooks up. It's, it's a top-down camera, so it actually is optimized to show something that you'd be drawing or showing. Okay. And that hooks in really well with some of the the web sharing apps. So I know it works well with um, with WebEx. I'm not sure how well it does with Hangouts. Haven't tried it yet. But yeah. that's great because you can actually have another window, another presence right. um, within the context where you're actually drawing. And I saw a terrific um, video that was a tutorial on sketching that was hosted by a company called Oh shoot, um, something.io. They're fab inkwell.io. Inkwell, okay. And they had a really nice layout showing the sketching and then the audience and then the, the speaker and the slides. And it was really a very coherent, orchestrated experience. I'd never seen anything like that. So those are emerging. I don't yeah. I'm not a, an expert in them, but I should be and will be. <laughs> gotcha. Is, is there an is there an online uh, you mentioned Napkin Academy. Is, are there any other online resources that are possibly there to to help? Uh, you know, help folks like that are developers or even designers that don't want to let go of the mouse and all that kind of thing. You know, I'm I'm hitting a blank on that. Okay. I tend to learn mostly from books, so that yeah. is my value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, those books that you mentioned are fantastic. Maybe this is a good thing to keep offline. Maybe I don't know, but uh, well, there's I'm, one. The most inventive thing I've heard of is a Kickstarter campaign for um, sketch for I Sketch Note. And they're designing an iPad case that has a Moleskine on one side, which is a kind of a common, you know, sketch noting a kind of sketch behavior tool that many people in the ilk use. And then it has the iPad on the other, and the pen is not unique like you'd get with a live scribe or some of those smart pens that are out there. Right. But it does track and it records on the iPad. So it will actually record the physical sketches because they have that same problem. They're like, there's something intrinsically different about the feedback when you're sketching on paper, paper yeah. that we want to capture. Right. We just want to seamlessly move it in and out of the machine better than we right. do nowadays. I, can, I think that's great. Um, so go so find I, that. I, I, I love all the stuff that you've been talking about today. Uh, and then I didn't really get into your background and what you're doing, but what, tell us a little about you know, where you're at these days and what you've got going on in the next uh, few months. Sure. Uh, so I have a checkered past. Um, I, I kind of I came out of school ironically with um, a Bachelor of Fine Arts, which turns out to have had nothing to do with the <laughs> career path that I've selected, except maybe a high desire for experimentation and okay. invention. Cool. And uh, you know, like many, came out in an economy that was crap, so worked a bunch of piecemeal jobs till I finally found technology and just fell in love with it. So I was a sysadmin and then moved from there at the at the beginning of the web into that official webmaster role. Wow, sysadmin. I from know. From fine arts to sysadmin. That sounds like a lot of Unix and all that kind of Linux and all that. It was pretty awesome. Like I had to, we get to migrate <laughs> a small nonprofit. There were about 40 of us um, from one operating system to another. To, it was kind of crazy. Wow. Um, back in the day. But what, was, what being a webmaster really helped me do is just mature as a generalist. I've maintained my generalist stripes through all of the specialization that's happened in user okay. experience as it right. kind of evolved from web making into I spent a time as a developer. Mm -hmm. I'm not bad at it, but I'm incredibly slow, which right. is too bad. So right. not, not, that wasn't going to be a big thing for me. Um, gotcha. Into more of the interaction design, information architecture. Right. Uh, I've held lightly held most of these titles. And then through a consultancy, Adaptive Path, which was yeah. pioneering a lot of the yeah, user Yeah, Adaptive experience. Path was big on the whole user Yeah, so you were there for a little bit, I imagine. 
Yep, and then joined Luxor to get in, back into the entrepreneurial world. But I, when I left Luxor full time, so I'm still an advisor, still a co-founder. But I left during the summer because I think these visual methods have such power to help teams and entrepreneurs and companies move forward. That I'm a hundred percent in the sketch noting, graphic recording, visual capture, explaining through conceptual vi um, visuals. Like that is my bread and butter right now. And I'm validating some ideas for how technology can smooth those edges you were talking about. Well, well tell us, please don't hold back. I want to give us some ideas that you're thinking about validating here. Sure. If you're sure. willing, so if, you're, them, if you're okay to share. Yeah, them. absolutely. You know, no one's going to steal my crappy idea. Okay. All right, there right. we go. So you <laughs> have to say that. But one of the things I'm really curious about that's become took me longer than I'd hoped to get to is there's really two audiences. There's the people that are making that are using visuals as a thinking tool to listen better, to remember better, to integrate kind of things they want to hold on to and use um, in their lives. And for me, that's what's interesting about that is how can we even more effectively trace the making process and the sketching process to the actions and outcomes that they actually do because they've learned something new. Okay. So it's way too, so thinking about it as, as you know, TL, col, semicolon, DR, too long, didn't read. Right. And we have this now with books and we have it with videos and it's right. great you watch a TED talk but and you think 15 minutes or 18 minutes isn't that long and then you get Vine where you understand how much you can communicate in these little moments and right. I think everything is compacting that way. So how do we do that with visual information and still maintain the memorability in the action? Okay. So that's yeah, one piece of it. That's one. So uh, what what are you thinking to build there? Are you thinking of some way of taking like uh, some video and somehow building a one sheet out of it? Or I, I, yeah, I think what my, does that practically my, look like? That's what I'm trying to ask here. The, the features that I've been enjoying running around with and trying to validate have been really about making the process for um, making the process for learning and making sketches faster and simpler and smoother and more momentary. So instead of sitting down for an hour-long video or even a 20-minute video and practicum, like what can you do in five minutes when you're standing in line that will hone a visual or, or sketching skill without having to drag out a piece of paper or a marker? Wow. So what can you do super quickly and how can you show people pretty vibrant success and really fast loops? I like that. I love that, in fact. Uh, one of the issues we're having, even with smoking hot coffees, uh, a lot of people are are scared a little bit of watching a 45 minute long video and there's a lot of real wonderful information there and and it's really tricky to try to find a way to extract that quickly yeah. and so uh, yeah this is, a, this is a big problem yeah, it yeah. seems like there's so much great content out there which don't have any time it, so hopefully uh, what you're working on might solve some of that I hope so yeah so what are there any other ideas you're working on well the, the second idea is the counterpoint to that, which is for people who, I hate calling people consumers, so I think maybe um, watchers or listeners or kind of learners is a better right. term, but right. for people for whom they know that there's this wide, vast, exciting set of ideas out there, uh, but they are locked into time, time release mechanisms. A book is a time release mechanism. You have to sit down and focus, and it's, it's valuable. It's worth that investment, but it's hard to get that timing now. Um, and videos are a time release mechanism. So what could we do to use these, this visual presentation as a glanceable reference to figure out, almost look at it as a trailer, like figure out from a sketch, is this a video that looks appealing enough that I really want to dedicate my time to it? And so you can make more informed choices on it. And then after you've seen that video or watched that or read that book or gone through whatever that experience it is, maybe even face-to-face -face live as a conference, you have a reference point that helps you reactivate those learnings um, in your life, at, again, at a glanceable moment. Wow. So that's, that's the other from less of the makers and more of the learners that I'd like to explore. Gotcha. I have to say, both of those problems, that sounds um, very uh, difficult to solve. I don't know how, uh, how are you going to fix, figure that out? That's really challenging. Yeah, uh, well, and the best part is, is that there's been, there's already a very rich field called graphic recording and graphic facilitation, which has been around since the 70s and 80s. Okay. Um, and David Sibbett, who wrote a book called Visual Meetings, it's actually the big thinker on that. So he's awesome. You should read his stuff too. Okay. Uh, and, and so there's already, there's already the field and the knowledge out there. Okay. And so I have no expectation that I will solve this problem alone. <laughs> what I want to be is participating in a community right. so that the community visibility can help solve these problems together.
I love this. I love this. I have to say, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, I, you know, it's it's a real big reminder that I need to get a couple of these books and start doing some of these small little things every day to keep that sketching and thinking through via sketching as a tool in my tool belt. Uh, because I do get caught into f mocking things up before really thinking about the needs. Uh, that UX stack, uh, I would love if you would send me uh, an image of that or a photograph of that because I want to post that up. It's really great. Absolutely. And Lexer has a couple great slide share decks that go into it in more detail and kind of pick it apart. I'll send you links to those as well. i love to see that. And if people want to get a hold of you or uh, maybe want to reach out and talk to you, what's a good way of doing that? Sure. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at Kate Rutter. And my site, my personal domain is Intelletto. That's okay. I-N-T-E-L-L-E-T-O. It's an okay. Italian word. Okay. And if you go to Intelletto.com, you can see a bunch of stuff. I have a contact form there that kind of filters through and reaches me at whatever latest email I have. So that's awesome. the best way. That's great. Well, it's been, like I said, it's been an absolute pleasure. If there's any last bit of advice you give to the... Uh, budding entrepreneurs, developers, designers out there, what would it be? Mm, great question. Because it's so tricky to go out in the world and talk to people and there's such a fear until you see how powerful and fun that is, I would say try and be as curious about the people you serve as the solutions you deliver. I like that. Yeah, I agree. Any, any final tips on how we can be more curious? Um, Get out and do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. there's nothing, honestly. Yeah. No, no, you're right. You're right. There's no, you there's to, no you substitute. You have to invent curiosity or yeah. fascination. There's no Everyone substitute. has something unique that right. can change your product. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm definitely going to keep in touch with you. Hopefully, we can get you on again. Awesome. What a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. You too.